Hello students, my name is Moon and this is a short little video on how to take better notes, also known as how to be a better student. Those of you who feel like you already know what it takes to be a better student and you have documented results like good grades, you probably don't need this video or these notes. However, for those of you, or these notes, however, for those of you who feel like you could use a little help that maybe it's been a while since the last time, let me readjust my screen, it's been a while since the last time you uh, were in a class and you find yourself wondering if there was a better way to study than the way, the methods you are using now, then I encourage you to sit through the rest of this video and read all of these files so that you can pick up hints here and there. I'm not saying I know the one and only best way to study. It's really up to the individual. Everybody is a different kind of learner. You also, everybody also has different circumstances and backgrounds. So you got to eventually work out a system that works for you. However, this, these series of, fi of files is a, con a compilation of some very good points and tips that I have uh, found over the, over the time as myself being a student and then as being an instructor. And many times I have been both. So I hope you will find some of this useful. Please feel free to pick and choose as you like, whatever works for you. All right, all these files are available to you on Blackboard. So what you do is go to the Blackboard for your page. Don't worry about this. Uh, this is just an example, but these files have been uploaded to all of my classes. So you go to Course Documents and you will see a folder called Study Tips. So you click on that and you come to this display here. There's going to be also a link here for this very, very video that I'm making right now. So click on the very first one, read this first, read this first, click on that. So let's start off with a nice, a cute little phrase I picked up along the way. Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. What this is getting at is a positive mental attitude towards whatever it is you're trying to do, studying or work or relationships or anything like that. If you have a positive attitude, like you can do it, it is possible then you are more likely to succeed. I'm not saying that every time you try, you will succeed. Of course, there's failures in life. Failures build character. But uh, one thing is for sure, if you don't try, then you will not succeed. As the other saying goes, if you can't win if you don't play. Why are you in class? Why are you in this school? Why are you studying, whether it's trying to get a good grade in, in this uh, school because you want to eventually get a degree so that you can get a nice job, or you are already at work and now you have to learn something that's a little dry, it's, uh, the studying is, going, is a little hard going, but you need to succeed in order to keep your job or to excel at your job, or anything else where it takes some strong mental concentration, then a can-do attitude will go, will at least give you a chance of success. So many of you are taking this class because you want to go into healthcare eventually. And I mostly teach healthcare related classes or health related classes. And so there is an extra layer uh, that you have to approach this from, which is that you are learning how to take care of somebody else. And so now, not only do you have a responsibility to yourself to learn the things you are required to do so you can succeed at your own goals, but now somebody in the future is depending on you to get it right. They are depending on you to know what you're doing so that you help and instead of, pro that you bring help instead of causing harm. For at one thing for sure, they do not want to hear any excuses from you. They don't want you to say, I was too busy to study. Let's flip this around. Let's say you or somebody you really care about is now being taken care of by a healthcare provider, whatever role that is. Do you want that person to say, 
to you, I didn't, I don't know this part because I was too busy to study? Or how about a little more realism here? How about uh, you call 911 and into the door comes an EMT or paramedic or a nurse or a doctor who you recognize that you never forget a face and there it is, your classmate, your old former classmate in class. The problem is that you remember, remember this person and this person had the attitude of like, that some of them that would outright say, what is the minimum I have to do to pass this course? Is that the kind of person you want about to put their hands on you, about to give you medication? about to provide life-saving or curative therapies. Um, if I saw somebody like that walking through the door, I would say, no, no, not you, not you. I want somebody else. Uh, oh, I won't get anybody else? Then I don't want any help. You will do more harm than good. Get out of my house. That's the kind of act, because you are protective of yourself, you are protective of your loved ones. Okay, uh, which leads me to the golden rule in healthcare, treat your patients the way you would want somebody else treating your loved ones. So it doesn't also, not only does that mean doing the right thing, uh, being professional, being compassionate, but it also means maintaining your knowledge, under, uh, keeping up with your continuing medical, medical education, and it also means doing the best you can in school learning the things you're supposed to learn. Okay. Uh, studying is like a muscle. Though most of you by now have seen me in real, in real time, and if I were to tell you, guess what? I'm gonna run the New York City Marathon this coming summer. Uh, if you were honest, as honest as I am to myself, you would say, uh, I don't think so. I, are you sure you want to do that? Maybe you want to scale it back a little. You know, maybe you can try for the marathon uh, two years from now, but maybe not this summer. And I would say you are right. It is too much to attempt too soon. So if you were to tell yourself in secret, so nobody can hear you, but if you were to tell yourself, I am going to become the perfect student tomorrow, then it's not likely. Nobody is the perfect student, by the way. I am by far from a perfect student. I make lots of mistakes. I procrastinate just like everybody else. But if I were, if I were to say I'm gonna be the perfect student tomorrow, it, I know it's unrealistic. So how are you supposed to get better at this? Keep practicing, keep trying. Every day you'll get a little bit better. And, my, and I mean only a little bit better. Every week you get a little bit better, and I mean only a little bit better, but eventually you'll get there. Just like your exercise program, just like your nutrition program, what you need to do is start slow, ramp up slow. If you try for too hard, too fast, then too soon, then you're going to break something. Or plans are not going to turn out the way you thought, and you're going to have a lot of regret. Um, this phrase, I need to say this better. Maybe for the next semester, I'll think of a better way to say it. Everybody procrastinates. You're not the only one. Everybody procrastinates. Uh, some of us just are able to um, schedule it better, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, we all procrastinate, but we are able to, uh, may, but in order to succeed at what you're trying to do, you got to get a, get a handle on it. So one thing that I do is I allow myself to procrastinate in healthy chunks. But at some point I know, all right, that's it. I, this is due tomorrow. This is due tomorrow. I cannot pull it off any time longer. Any, uh, put it off any longer. I got to get this done. Okay. This next set of phrases is the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. The fixed mindset is the way you are is the way you are. Uh, it is what it is, and there's no point in trying to change. You're, it's not going to, there's no hope for you. The growth mindset is, okay, I am the way I am now, but I can get better. 
I have the ability, I have the power. In many of my classes, I teach something called self-efficacy, the word. Uh, you need to know that for the major exams, the definition. And so I am what I am now, but I can get better. So I'm not smart now. That's very honest of you. I'm not smart either, but I can learn. And that's the right way to take to deal with it. I'm always learning. I'm not good. Very honest of you. Thank you for your your, your um, straightforwardness. Uh, but I can get better. See this? My teacher's out to get me. I've heard this a few times. You're out to get me. You, all, you, all you want me to do is fail. No. What I'm doing is not settling for less. When I criticize you, when I scold you, when I talk to you, when I engage with you, it means I see you have potential to improve that you and that you can make it. So I'm trying to push you to the finish line. The one thing you don't want me to do in class is to leave you alone. When I leave you alone in class, well, after, after I've been pushing you and demanding things from you, and then one day I suddenly start leaving you alone, it means I gave up on you. You don't want that to happen. You want me to be on your side, pushing you to the finish line. Every expert used to be a beginner. Doesn't matter who. I mean, how did, uh, uh, look at anybody who is world famous, look at anybody who you respect, how did they get that way? Did they, were they born like that? Obviously not. They started on this side and through a variety of factors, they were able to make it over to this side you can do it too. So this growth versus, do you see my, okay, this growth versus fixed mindset is um, very pretty, prettily, attractively arranged in this diagram. From the ACUE, uh, I love this organization. I hope they don't mind that I'm plugging them, that I, uh, and uh, later on, maybe not now, but um, later on in your career, uh, you should look these guys up, look these people up, because they have some awesome stuff. Okay. When you're, when something uh, takes a lot of effort to do, your brain puts higher value on it. When something is easy to do, your brain puts lower value on it. Uh, and this is true for pretty much everything in life. When you spend more on something, you think it's higher quality. And the stores know this so they would take like two things and uh, put them slap on two separate labels and they would charge more for one and not and less for the other and these are two exactly same things the one they charge less for they're going after like the discount crowd but they know that there's like a segment of society who is like willing to pay more for quality so they just put a higher price tag and then suddenly the person thinks that what they're buying is better. So this is a psychological trick that has been used on you. People do it, people use it on you all the time. Why not use this trick on yourself to trick you into remembering things that you're studying? Early victories give you encouragement. Um, the, one of the problems with uh, trying to achieve too much too soon is that you have no intermediary step and you have no way to encourage yourself. There are no milestones, there's uh, none of that for you to uh, take a break, look around, uh, pat yourself on the back, give yourself a thumbs up and then go back into it. Uh, so, and eventually, if you don't have these milestones, you're gonna start wearing down, you're gonna start um, getting fatigued and eventually you're gonna give up. So break up whatever it is you're trying to do in life, break it up into small manageable chunks and then schedule a reward at the end of each chunk. Whatever, I mean, whatever it is, like let, you can finally allow yourself to watch that video that you've been wanting to watch at the end of the chunk, at the end of a chapter, at the end of, a, a, at, at the end of writing a page or a paragraph, whatever it is, break up what you're trying to do into chunks and then schedule little rewards in it. 
Um, one of the things that derail people's attempts to study is that they take all of these little things they would like to do and do them first. And then next thing they know, hours have passed by, days have passed by, and they never did the thing they were supposed to do. They never did the study. They never wrote the paper. Instead, take all of the little things you were going to do, the snacks, the videos, the, the happy times with friends, the, um, all the little pleasures in life, and schedule them throughout your, your work plan as little rewards. People say this all the time. I'm a great multitasker. Uh, no, you're not. If you are human, you are not a multitasker. Computers are great multitaskers. Kind of, kind of. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of computer architecture, but uh, like the, uh, in the old days, the, the single core processor computers were not, liter were not technically multitasking. They were spending like a, a microsecond on each different task but none of the tasks were happening simultaneously. Okay, enough of that tangent. You, as a human, you do not multitask. You are not a multiprocessor supercomputer. You cannot multitask. Your mind can only focus on one thing at a time. But, but, but I, I can cook, I can do the laundry, I can change a diaper, I can listen to my favorite music, all at the same time. No, you're not, you are not doing all of that you are not concentrating on all those different things at the same time. What's happening is each one of those tasks, cooking, changing a diaper, listening to music, all of those tasks are things you have done many, many times before to the point where each one of those tasks now have been turned into muscle memory so that each one of those you can set on autopilot. And so your main concentration lobes of your brain are free to think of something else. So what, you are, what you're really doing when you think you're multitasking is delegating the auto, autopilot muscle memory to handle each of the things you already know how to do and know, very, know how to do very well. And then your general consciousness is just popping from one, sec, one process to another to make sure that each one is continuing on track. When it's time to actually focus on something, something new, something difficult, then you need complete concentration. Isn't there that uh, a little, uh, isn't there a common comedian joke, stand-up comedian joke of they say, ever wonder how when you're driving down the road and you're looking for something, you would turn down the radio, like, come on, how, why is it, why is it that you would turn down the radio when we're trying to um, navigate to some point, when we think we're lost? Uh, because our brain is getting distracted from the music and we're, it is, we are not able to multitask. And when you're trying to do something new that's complicated, then you have to focus by yourself. You, it needs your full attention, which means turn off the music. Uh, well, what about the diaper changing? You know, you uh, if the kids got to go, they got to go, right? All right. So there are some life events that you cannot delay. You cannot put off. You have to address them. There are some emergencies you have to go attend to, things that are urgent and important. Okay. So you cannot do anything about that. But don't, so you cannot stop some of life's emergencies, urgent matters from intruding into your study time. But don't voluntarily give up your, your study time. Here, oh yeah, uh, I jumped the slide. Uh, but I have a real life and I get interruptions and I have to handle them. Uh, okay, I understand that, you have a real life. So there are some things that you have to attend to that are urgent and important and you cannot stop those from happening. But don't choose to add more things, more interruptions, more things that are urgent but not important. See the difference? There are some things that are urgent and are important that you can't stop from happening. But there are some things that are urgent but not important that you can choose to put off until after your study time is over. 
or until your next uh, break point when you allow yourself a little reward for making it this far like you finished a chapter you finished a page whatever you finished a homework assignment and now you can go and take care of the things that are urgent but not important don't choose to increase your distractions you are distracted in, you get your distractions down to the minimum you have to have because of life's important facts or, or events but then don't choose to have more distractions on top of that this uh, little segment here is because I'm a boomer I grew up before the internet I grew up when if I didn't want to be interrupted I mean I mean there were very few interruptions minute by minute maybe there was an maybe there was a phone call a couple of times a day but and somebody when I was at work somebody may pop into the cubicle or the office you know once an hour but that was it uh, when I look around today and I see people getting notifications on their phone every five seconds I'm wondering how are they able to concentrate on anything they can do the things that are they think they're multitasking you're changing a diaper for the 1,000th time and then you get a, a, dis, a phone notification. Okay, it's easy because you're not concentrating on changing the diaper. But if you're learning something new that's complicated, that's boring, that's dry, it takes time for your mind to focus in and that's called the brain train. The phrase brain train is that idea of how, how long does it take for a train to get up to speed? then that's kind of like how long it takes your brain to finally settle down and start to pay attention to the thing you're trying to study. And then every time you get a distraction that pulls your, your mind out of it, then in order to get back into that topic you're trying to study, again, you have to start over from zero miles per hour and slowly work your way up like a train. So some things you cannot some interruptions you cannot stop from happening, but there are some interruptions that you can stop from happening, things that are not that important. So put them off. Turn off your phone if you have to. Um, turn your phone to vibrate and then hide it under a pillow. Uh, tell your friends and family, I am setting aside this many hours to study. Please don't interrupt me. Okay. Repetition is memory. Uh, I've had students say I read the book if there was a book I read the I read the slides and I didn't remember anything well how many times did you read the slides once uh, so well there's your problem you if you are hitting or some students try to get away with never reading the book if there was a book some students try to get away with never watching my videos and I'm saying I'm not saying you have to watch my videos my pride is not on the line uh, but uh, the the videos were put there to help you study, and if you if you think that sitting through the lecture by itself is good enough, then I'm telling you it's not enough. You have to read the material, whether it's book or online. You have to check out the videos that are made available to you, and you have to do it not just once but multiple times. Repetition is memory. Um, so let's say you have a book I know several of my classes don't have a required textbook but let's say you are taking a class that does have a required textbook because these study tips are helpful for other classes you take elsewhere and in the future so let's say you have uh, you know that the teacher is going to go through a certain chapter next week you really should how do you rep how do you repeat in order to improve your memory well, what you do is read the chapter before the lecture, and what you do is you preview the chapter first. So skim the headings to see like where the chapter is going, and then read the chapter once before the lecture. And I know you're not gonna remember most of it because you're hitting these new concepts for the very first time. It's okay. What's going on is you're putting the memory of encountering these words, these concepts in place so that now you show up for class and you hear and what you're hearing now is all these concepts and terminology for the second time 
When you meet somebody brand new for the first time, they'll tell you their name and then five seconds later, if you're anything like me, five seconds later, they'll forget. But then you meet the person again for the second time and if you're anything like me, you're gonna say, oh, hi, yeah, you're, the, you're that guy from uh, that place uh, and your name is, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. It's okay, it's okay. Uh, some people get offended if, you know, if people don't remember their name from meeting them the first time. I do not. If you don't remember my name, it's okay. I don't get offended because I'm exactly like that. But what's happening is, uh, I'm sorry, I'll say, I'm sorry, what's your name again? I forgot. I'm terrible with names. And then they'll say, oh yeah, it's okay, my name is. And I'm hearing their name for the second time. What's most likely will happen is that if I meet them one week later, I will forget their name again. But I will come right out and say, please don't take this uh, impersonally, but, or please don't be angry, but uh, I forgot your name again. And they'll tell, say, say, fine, no problem, my name is. And I heard it for the third time. And by then, I will be so embarrassed that um, I will attach that feeling of embarrassment to that data point, that factoid, your name is. And then I will most likely remember that person's name the next time. So what happened? It's repetition. Your brain is going, oh, what, what is this? You're, I'm, I'm hearing this terminology definition or this concept for the third time. This must be important. So three times, uh, more the, the more the merrier. The more repetition you can do, the, the better you are likely to remember this thing. So read the chapter before class, read, um, follow the outline of the chapter during class as you take more notes as the teacher tells you what parts to emphasize. And then read the chapter after class so that your brain is like, all right, this is the third time we're running into this idea. May, it must be important. And they're gonna move these things from short-term memory to long-term memory. I said the word outline here. What do you mean by outline? This is what I mean by outline. Okay. Have you ever read something boring and by the time you get to the bottom of the page, you forgot what you read at the top of the page? That happens to me every time. I don't mean most of the time. It happens to me every time. Such that now I know when there is some dry technical manual or uh, class chapter where I'm the student and I'm learning all this for the first time, I will be taking notes as I go, as I'm reading. The I have a blank piece of paper next to me or I have a blank text screen editor next to me on the screen so that as I encounter ideas, terminologies, I type that in or write that down as I go so that when I get to the bottom of the page, and I'm struggling to remember what, what were they talking about at the top of the page. I look at my notes and the beauty of writing down things down is that you put these things in your own words. And I mean write. I don't mean copy and paste. Don't go like this and then control C and then go to the editor, control V, copy, paste, there. You did not write that. You wrote control C, control V. You did not write the actual words. And you really don't want to use the literal word by word copy on the book. What you want to do is take whatever that paragraph was and summarize it in your own words. What that's doing is forcing your mind to understand what they're saying so that you can put it in a different set of words. How else would you, how else would you know which words to pick if you didn't understand it, right? So that is a one line summary for every paragraph. And then by the time you finish the chapter, you have finished an outline of this book, uh, of this chapter. So that if your mind is thinking, I don't remember reading any of this, you go to your notes and you see, aha, see, I did, I did. And I did think about each one of these, okay. Writing an outline in your own words is far, far superior to highlighting. There was one student 
there's been a few students who were really struggling in class and finally I asked, let me see your notes. And I said, I don't have notes. Oh, wait, so were you, how were you, how were you reading the chapters? And they say, oh, I just start from page, the first page and just make it my way to the end of the page. And I'm thinking, I don't even remember the top of the page by the time I get to the bottom. How is this student remembering the entire chapter from reading it once? So I asked them that, how do you remember all of this that you read? Why do you have like a photographic memory? And they say, no, I was highlighting. Okay, let me see your highlights. So they show me, they open the textbook and they show me, and every line is highlighted. That this whole textbook is like one pound heavier with all of the highlighter ink that's been absorbed into the pages. That's not how you highlight. Highlight is you literally pick words to highlight so it stands out from the page. But also, highlighting is not writing down. Highlighting is just passing a pen across the page. It's not forcing you to remember, to understand and summarize like writing an outline. So in, out of this entire slideshow, out of this entire micro lecture, I would say this slide is really the most important slide. When you are reading things, high, um, type in your own words in some place else to force your mind to make an effort to understand what's going on. Let's say you have uh, a study partner, which is a great idea for those of you who don't have a study, par study partner and who are struggling in class, like struggling to get good grades. I strongly recommend you find one so that you can motivate each other to stick to the schedule and also by explaining things to another person you're doing again you are summarizing things in your own words anyway you have your par study partner and you and you get your materials ready for your study partner session study groups are also better than study partners by the way so you are getting ready for your session and then your study date and they see the outline you made and you say, oh my God, this is awesome. This, this is incredible stuff. Do you mind if I take a picture of it? What should you say? Well, if it was me, I would say, yeah, sure, go ahead. Knock yourself out. Me, me outline is Sue outline. Go ahead, take up as many pictures as you want. And I do it for two reasons. First of all, I want them to stay my friend. So the more positive interactions we have, the better. Like if I said, no, no, write your own, then that's a negative interaction, right? So I want to build up, uh, build a friendly relationship with this person. So say, yeah, sure, yeah, go ahead. It don't cost me nothing, right? And the second reason I let them study, I take a picture is by taking a picture they have not learned a single thing. They have not made the effort to make the outline themselves. So their brain, their brain, I'm going back by a few slides, their brain for whom you just, what did you do? What effort did that student, did that friend do? All they did was press a button on a cell phone. That's it to take a picture. So they made zero or very minimum, near zero effort to get a copy of that outline. Their brain is going to say, ah, must not be important because there was no effort put into it and they will forget. They will put that picture in some folder labeled very important, must read, and they will never read it. You, however, who have made the outline will have made the effort to put into it your brain will say oh my i just spent i just spent the past three hours making this stupid outline on this stupid chapter for this stupid class i am so tired i'm going to go watch my cat video but by putting the effort in your brain says this must have been important look how much look how much my person suffered for this outline so they will remember it. They will put the thoughts that you've been going through to make that outline, 
to remember it. In fact, if you were to ever lose the outline, I'm not saying that you should, it's a valuable piece of property, but uh, if you were to accidentally lose the outline or get it stolen, it's like no, it, 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 you'll be able to quickly make another one because all of that knowledge is in your head. The piece of paper is not really where your knowledge is sitting. The piece of paper is just an outline. The knowledge is actually in your head by making the outline. You have studied, you have learned. Make an outline. Other study aids uh, you may have or you probably have already heard about like index cards or if you're having trouble getting yourself a pack of index cards. I don't know what inflation is like nowadays. Maybe uh, you don't have time to go to the store or you're, you're really strapped for cash, uh, strained for cash. Okay, so make your own index cards. Take a blank piece of paper, draw red lines and blue lines or black lines and then cut it off, cut it up with a piece of paper, scissors. Make your own index cards. Um, I, I grew up in the days before the internet, so this was my way to make other another study. So let's say you have a list of words. Let's say you have a list of words and then their definitions. I would put it on a blank piece of paper and then I would leave this third blank so that I can fold it over and then hide the definition so I can test myself without peeking at the answer. Um, don't tell anybody, but I usually do pick, peek at the answer. Uh, but the idea is that at, with repetition, you do this again and again and again until you don't have to peek anymore. And you can run down this list of terminologies and rattle off the definitions, no problem, and you now know it. Um, if you don't want to do it this way, you can also do it this way, which is get another piece of paper and then Show, expose the definition one at one item at a time as your study. By now, you guys were supposed to have finished the pre-survey, and there was a a few curious questions at the end of the pre-survey. Did you notice things like, did you ever feel like you don't belong in class? Did you ever feel like you're not really smart? Did you ever feel like if people really got to know you for who you really are, they will, dis they will decide that you're not as great as they thought you were and they will be disappointed in you? Like, why would I ask questions like that? Uh, this is all part of something called imposter syndrome. And lots of people suffer from it. I think the only people who don't suffer from it are narcissists and um, politicians. Okay, maybe some politicians suffer from it. And, and what's happening is uh, you look at somebody and they seem so confident, they seem so uh, badass, they seem so skilled. And you, if you find out later that you know that person was suffering from imposter syndrome, like that's impossible. How, how is it? How are they able to? I mean, what, how is that possible? Um, some people are really good at hiding this than others. And students are not the only ones who go through this. Teachers go through this. Presidents probably go through this at some point or another. Uh, politicians um, uh, probably go through this at some point or another. Uh, the only people I think who don't suffer from this are the narcissists. This is a real thing. And the reason why I put those questions in the pre-survey is just to find out is not only to find out how many people in class as a percentage of class uh, are admitting this, but also when I share the results with the rest of the class, you can see that you're not alone, that, um, that you are among friends and that you can support each other. This is a, a TED Talk video but it's not like the person, it's not the kind of TED talk where the person is on stage just monologuing. It's, uh, it's a delightful graphical presentation. Uh, very approachable, um, ve very easy to listen to. The narrator has a very pleasant voice. You will like it a lot. And it's a description of this imposter syndrome. 
So, next slide. If you feel like you are suffering from a imposter syndrome, first of all, know that you are not alone, that lots of people feel this way. And then here is a list of things you can do to battle it, to get a handle on it. Um, don't think though that it's it's that you're gonna cure be cured overnight. Like lot, just like a lot of other things in psychology, uh, they don't cure overnight or instantaneously. It's more of a, a lifelong journey. But at the at least now you are some of you are now aware that this is a thing. You've put a label on the problem, whereas before you knew you felt bad, but you couldn't explain why. Well, here now you have an explanation, uh, a label. And when you put a label on things, you make it easier to manage it, to handle it. Almost done, almost done, almost done. Okay, the next couple of slides for, for those of you who go and practice a skill. So the some of the classes I teach, there's no skills to do, but there are like exercises, like calculations you can do. Um, but for no matter who you are, you could end up somewhere um, learning a new skill. Like you are assigned an instructor, who a skills instructor who teaches you this thing, and then uh, and then let you try it a few times. They say, and then after you finally get it right, they say, good job and then they move on to the next person. And then sooner, before you know it, the class is over, the session is over, and then they say, now go out there and make us proud. Uh, but are you ready? Are you really ready? If I show you, um, if I show you a golf ball, is that not a good example? If I show you uh, a tennis ball and say that this is a tennis ball and this is a racket and this is how you swing the racket and this is how you hit the ball and then there's a tennis court and you have to get it over the net to the other side okay so now let's practice and so we work together I, I'm not good at tennis by the way I'm just randomly picking an example um, we work together like you, you and the tennis instructor work together and finally, after several swings and misses, you finally hit the ball. And then after several more tries, you finally get the ball over the net. And after several more tries, you finally, the ball finally goes over the net and lands on the, the uh, regulation green squares on the other side. And the instructor says, great job. And then moves on to the next student. Are you ready for the US Open? Are you ready for tournament play? Are you ready to even play one whole game with somebody else? And obviously not. What do you gotta do? You gotta practice, practice, practice. What about the person who learns how to hit a tennis ball with a racket and say, I understand, I got it. Okay, this is all makes sense to me. And then for the rest of the practice session, they go to the bench they pick, pull out their phone and start texting their friends, watching videos, playing computer games, um, checking the news, looking at their stock market prices like that. What's going to happen to that person? They're not going to move their skill from introduction to proficiency. And if it's a healthcare class, and if it's a health applying healthcare therapies class, this person is next gonna go out there and ex be expected to do this skill flawlessly for real people having real problems and they're going to utterly fall apart. They're gonna, if they do barely just, learn it just enough to pass the exams, then they'll graduate, go out there, and then not do good. Gonna do more harm than good out there. Don't be this person, always Whenever there's a chance to practice, whenever there's a scheduled practice session, be aggressive. Don't hang back. Don't tell you, don't think you're too cool for this. Be aggressive. Go to the, push your way to the front. Demand time with the instructor. Am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? Try to keep practicing. And so now, one of the things that may cause a student to hang back and not practice when it's their chance is that they're afraid of 
embarrassing themselves. They're, they're afraid of making a mistake. They're afraid of um, looking bad in front of their classmates or doing something bad. Everybody who's been good at anything started out as a beginner. They all, everybody made mistakes. Everybody failed when they were starting out as a beginner. You are no different. There's nothing special about you. There's nothing magical about you. You are not going to jump from beginner to expert just because you understand. And I'm using air quotes, understand. What you need to do is accept that you will fail in the beginning. You'll probably fail in the middle and you still fail a few times even when you're out there and you are, everybody thinks of you as the expert. You will still fail. But in class, it's okay. Out there, that's bad. But in class, it's okay. Failing means you are learning. Who learns more about cars? The ones whose cars never have a problem or the ones whose car is always breaking down. They're always taking it to a mechanic. They're always um, Googling the symptoms, reading up, watching videos from other mechanics about how to do this or that about their car, comparing prices of parts. Is it cheaper to fix it yourself or is it cheaper in the long run to have pay somebody else to do it? The person who is frequently in a fail situation will learn more than the person who is succeeding all the time. Somebody who is success, successful all the time will never learn anything. They'll come out of that experience knowing no more than the beginner. So I'm telling you, when you are in a healthcare therapy class, like ENT or paramedic, you should kill as many imaginary patients as possible. Because when you are in class, the scenarios will be put forward to you. You get to try things on a mannequin. Um, and here is your chance to screw up pain, uh, screw up without consequences. So screw up so that you will learn more while you are in class. Practice, practice, practice. Okay. Um, maybe I should have put this slide before the previous slide. Okay, that's it. So I've taken up enough of your time. Thank you for your patience. Um, I'm telling, I just want to end this with uh, the encouragement that you can do this. You can do this. You made it this far. You made your decision. You, you've committed. You've made your decision. You've committed to this project of become taking this class, doing well in this class, so you can get out there and go for the goals that you chose. Uh, you can do it, it's possible. Many students before you have done this and succeeded, and you can do it too. But what you gotta do is always try to improve what you're doing now by learning, learning, and practicing. So good luck, and I'll see you in class.